Good morning. Uh, This is the last in the present series of talks in the Sermon on the Mount and uh, I'm going to begin by reading from Matthew 7 verse 21 and following. So hear the word of the Lord from Matthew 7 verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the wind blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundations on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, because he taught as one who had authority, and not as their teachers of the law. Well, let's uh, pray and ask for God's help as we think about that passage. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for a living word, for a dying world, and we pray that you would speak to us now through this text and change our lives, change our hearts, change our minds. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Counterfeiting is a very big business. Criminals have discovered that they can make very large sums of money by producing cheap copies and then undercutting the price of the genuine article. It seems that today there are fakes everywhere. Apparently, even the world of medicine is not immune from the problem. Uh, As we try today to try and adapt to the menace of COVID-19, It's sobering to realise that the trade in counterfeit medicine is a huge industry. The global market in fake medicine is worth around $200 billion per annum and 42% of that market is in Africa. Designer goods are another lucrative opportunity for the ambitious criminal. Uh, Levi jeans are the most copied merchandise in the world. Apparently, it's almost impossible to tell whether you've bought a genuine pair of Levi jeans. The real article will have a little red tag sewn into the back pocket, and there's a three-digit number on a stud on the inside of the front. But sometimes the counterfeiters go to enormous lengths to copy even those tiny details. And in most cases, it's almost impossible for anybody except the manufacturer, except the maker, to tell the difference between a fake and the real thing. Now this morning we've come to the last session in the Sermon on the Mount. And I think it is a frightening passage Because the Lord Jesus Christ is saying that there is such a thing as a counterfeit Christian. He says there are many of them. Now that is the plain meaning of verse 22. These people look like the real thing. Many are taken in by them. And sometimes they even fool themselves. But one day their maker will examine them. And he can always spot a fraud. And when he does, uh, the result won't be simply a fine or a few years in prison. It will be eternal separation from his presence. Yes, it is a solemn note on which to end this great sermon. And the message is is unmistakable. Jesus is saying to us, 
Make sure you are not a fake Christian. When your maker examines you, make sure that you are found to be the genuine article, the real thing. And to help us, Jesus points to the number one distinguishing mark of an authentic Christian. And it is obedience. That is the great theme of the two paragraphs we're looking at this morning. In verses 21 to 23, Jesus looks for obedience more than words. And then in verses 24 to 27, Jesus looks for obedience more than knowledge. So firstly then, Jesus looks for obedience more than words. Uh, Have a look at verse 21. Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. In our series, we've been discovering that the the kingdom of heaven is the great theme of Jesus' teaching, the main theme. Uh, Now, as you know, the Bible begins with the account of the creation of the world. God made everything. He had authority over everything. He is the king. And uh, in the beginning, his kingdom included everything. That's how the world was designed. And everything makes sense and fits together when God is being acknowledged as king. But sadly, it didn't stay that way for long. The first human beings rebelled against God. They decided that life would be more fun if they lived it their way. And so they rejected God's authority. And human beings have been living like that ever since. Now, of course, God could simply destroy us for our rebellion, uh, our pathetic coup, our feeble attempt at power holds no terrors for him but uh, with great patience down the years he's allowed it to continue and yet at the same time he's also given clear warnings throughout the Bible that one day his patience will run out and when it does God will act decisively to re-establish his kingdom on earth And when that day comes, there'll be a great division. God's enemies will be destroyed, and only those who've submitted to his righteous rule will survive and be able to enjoy life as life was designed to be lived, with everything in its proper place under God, under his loving rule. Now, for generations, the people of Israel have been waiting for that moment, waiting for God's kingdom to come. And so I think we can imagine the sense of expectation when Jesus of Nazareth began to preach. Matthew, the Gospel writer, summarises his message for us back in chapter 4, just before the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, So in chapter 4 and verse 17, Matthew says... From that time on, Jesus began to preach, Repent, for the kingdom of God is near. And again in chapter 4, verse 23, Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom. So the message was that at last, God's king had come. He had come to restore God's kingdom and to re-establish God's authority. Now that is good news. God's rule was going to be re-established, everything was going to be put right again, but it was only good news for some, for those who had submitted to that rule, for those who belonged to the kingdom. The rest would face destruction for their continued rebellion, And so, by the end of chapter 4, there's an obvious question that we should be asking, which is, well, who belongs to this kingdom? If it's only good news for those who are in it, for those who've repented, how can we make sure that we're part of it? And the answers are found in the Sermon on the Mount. So, having, as it were, set up the issue for us in chapter 4 with Jesus 
announcing the breaking in of the kingdom of heaven, chapters 5 to 7 tell us who's in it. That is the theme of the Sermon on the Mount. So look at chapter 5 and verse 3. This is how the sermon begins. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So you see, the central issue in the sermon is membership of God's kingdom. Now look how it ends in chapter 7 and verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Those are the words of Jesus. You see, in the Sermon on the Mount, it would be a great mistake to think that Jesus has simply been preaching uh, as a moralist, uh, suggesting that we might perhaps like to uh, pull our socks up and giving us one or two ideas about how we might do that. Now, in this sermon, Jesus is preaching as an evangelist, pleading with us to be ready for the coming kingdom of God. And he's urging us to repent before it's too late. There's a real urgency in the message. Now, of course, we saw that last week in the previous passage, where Jesus explained that there are two destinies for mankind, only two. There's destruction or life, and there's no third option. Jesus urges us to choose the narrow way that leads to life, and he warned us, didn't he, not to be taken in by false prophets, because they point to a different way, and a different road. And last week, the message Jesus was giving us was, choose life. Now that would have been a very neat and rather tidy way to end the sermon. But having said choose life, Jesus hasn't quite finished. He's concerned that some people will delude themselves into thinking that they've passed through the narrow gate when they haven't, and that they're on the narrow road when they're not. And that's why Jesus adds verses 21 to 23. Uh, it describes a scene at the end of time on the day of judgment and Jesus says that on that day there are going to be many people who receive a terrible shock. They've assumed all along that they'll be fine. After all, they've got their theology pretty straight because they call Jesus Lord. So they know that he's no mere human being. They recognise him for who he is the God-man, God himself in human form, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. They can happily recite any creed and they can sign any statement of faith you put in front of them. And they'll sing along with everybody else in church on Sunday morning, He is Lord, He's Lord. He's risen from the dead, He is Lord. And when they stand before Jesus as their judge at the end of time, they'll have no hesitation in calling him Lord. In fact, they call him Lord, Lord. Yes, these people are earnest and they are insistent. And yet, in spite of all that, they don't enter God's kingdom. They're left out. Look at verse 22. Jesus says there, Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, evildoers. Just try and imagine the scene for a moment. I think it's a terrible one. You see, these people have believed themselves to be Christians for years. And here they are on the threshold of heaven itself, they can hear God's party going on inside and they're really looking forward to being part of it. They're all dressed up for the occasion. Now they walk confidently up to the front door and they knock. Jesus opens the door. Hello Lord, they say. And yet Jesus looks at them with a blank expression on his face. He doesn't move to let them in. One of them senses something's wrong and he says, Lord, you remember me, don't you? I went to Bible college. 
Um, I got ordained, I spent the next 40 years preaching the gospel, teaching. We saw spectacular growth in the church, many conversions, and even one or two miraculous healings. And yet Jesus still doesn't move away from the door. Another one speaks up and says, Lord, surely you remember me. Uh, you gave me that marvellous experience five years ago and I felt so close to you, so peaceful. And what about that mission team that I joined last summer? Uh, a number of people came, came up to me at the end of it and said how much they'd appreciated the testimony that I gave. Lord, you really used me. And yet Jesus doesn't move. And after a long pause, Jesus says, I'm terribly sorry, but I don't think we've met, have we? I don't know you. And the door is shut. You see, these people look like the real thing. They look like the genuine article. They've even convinced themselves. But when the maker examines them, he can see them for just what they are. Fakes. Now, what's the problem? The problem is that they don't have what all true Christians must have. And that is obedience. That's what's missing. Look again at verse 21. Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father, who is in heaven. You see, they call Jesus Lord with their lips, but they, they don't live for Jesus as Lord in their lives. And uh, the last word of verse 23 is a chilling summary of their true situation. Jesus calls them evildoers. Now the great question is, what about us? It may be that we believe all the right things, uh, we've been active in Christian work, and God has used us and we call him Lord and that's wonderful but Jesus says to us this morning do you do God's will? do you obey him? and if not well actually we have no reason to be confident about the future because we won't be judged on the basis of what we say we can't expect that because we use the magic password Lord that all the doors into God's kingdom are going to automatically open up for us now Jesus looks for obedience more than words, that's the message of the first paragraph then secondly in verses 24 to 27 Jesus looks for uh, obedience more than knowledge so in the final paragraph of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus wraps up his message in one final, very powerful illustration. He invites us to imagine two houses. On the outside, they're very similar, and a superficial glance would suggest that they're both worth the same amount of money. And yet, a prospective buyer would be well advised to call in a surveyor, because one of those houses is a complete dud. Uh, the builder thought that he would save a bit of time and money, so he decided to not bother with laying any foundations. Instead, he built the house on sand. So, so far, he's got away with it. And yet, when the next big storm hits, the house comes crashing down. Uh, by contrast, the house next door is an absolutely wonderful investment. The builder ensured the foundations were solid. It took more time, yes, and it cost a bit more money, but it was well worth it. And uh, it's got nothing to fear when the winter gales hit because its foundations are on solid rock. It's built to last. So Jesus says to us in this illustration that we have a choice. Which house would we choose to represent our life? A storm is coming, and it's not the coronavirus, it's the storm of God's judgment. But don't take it from me, it's what Jesus says. So on that day, will we stand, or will we be destroyed? The Lord Jesus spoke about hell and judgment more than just about anything else. 
Uh, the most loving man who ever lived thought it was important to warn us about this terrible reality. There are three main images that the Bible uses to talk about hell. Uh, so there's punishment and that's the, the language of fire and torment. Uh, then there's exclusion. Uh, we saw that in verse 23, the idea of being separated from God forever. And then the third image is destruction and that's what we have here. No doubt the house on the sand looked beautiful with its gable windows and its fresh paint. No doubt there were beautiful shrubs uh, climbing up the outside. And yet once the storm has hit all that remains is a pile of rubble. What a waste. If only the builder had taken a bit more trouble it would still be standing but now there's nothing left. Now that's how it's going to be, says Jesus, with those who do not enter God's kingdom now. The impressive lives that they've built for themselves will come crashing down and it won't last. And all the money, all the qualifications, all the possessions will count for nothing. What a tragic end to a life. And Jesus says it doesn't have to be like that you can build your life in such a way that it will last for eternity. Now, the storm of God's judgment won't touch it. You can continue forever in God's kingdom. Now those two builders, uh, those two houses, stand for two types of people. Look at, look at this again, verse 24. Therefore everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. So there's the first type. The second is in verse 26. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. It's very s interesting, isn't it, how similar they are. Because both of them hear the words of Jesus. Both of them are in church listening to the sermon. Both of them are in the midweek Bible study group. No doubt both of them read their Bibles regularly. But only one group puts it into practice. And that is the crucial, critical, vital difference. Obedience. And in the context, of course, Jesus is referring specifically to his teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. Remember its theme is the Kingdom of God and uh, Jesus has been pointing to the character of those people who belong to it and pointing to its standards. And now here at the end of the sermon he's calling us to respond to the teaching we've received because he says it's not enough merely to hear his words. It's not enough just to have studied them. It's not enough to have simply listened to the sermons or the podcasts or learned the memory verses. Those are all excellent things to be doing. But by themselves they're not enough. We must obey. Now can uh, I as a side just ask you to notice the astonishing claim that Jesus makes here. Because in verse 21, if you'd care to look at it, entry into the kingdom of heaven is conditional on our obedience to God the Father. But here, in this final paragraph, notice that it's obedience to the words of Jesus himself. And Jesus makes no distinction whatsoever between the two. So he's making an unmistakable claim that he is God. And so in verse 23... Notice this, the evildoers are excluded because they're not known by Christ. In other words, Jesus is saying that our eternal destiny is determined by our relationship with him. And that relationship is confirmed or disproved by the way we respond to his words. Now friends, either that is breathtaking arrogance or it's true. 
I mean, imagine that I started this sermon by saying, you need to listen extremely carefully to what I'm going to say today, because your response to me, Simon Clegg, and my words, the words of Simon Clegg, are going to determine your eternal destiny. That would be an amazingly arrogant thing to say, wouldn't it? And yet that is precisely the claim that Jesus is making here. No wonder that those who heard him responded as they did in verse 28. Look at that. The crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as the teachers of the law. You see, they'd never heard anything like this before. This teacher didn't point away from himself to some higher authority as the basis for his teaching. No, when Jesus taught, he pointed to himself. Uh, the rabbis would quote scripture as their authority, but Jesus simply said, I tell you, six times in this sermon alone. So Jesus was his own authority. And so I think it's fair to say that ultimately, the Sermon on the Mount confronts us not with radical teaching, but with a teacher. It forces you and I to make up our minds about this remarkable man who makes such breathtaking claims about himself. He says that he's come to fulfil the entire Old Testament. It was all pointing to him. He was right at the centre of God's plans for the whole world. And uh, through his ministry... God's kingdom is being brought near. He is God's king acting to re-establish God's authority on earth and one day he will be our judge and will only enjoy the benefits of his kingdom then if we've taken him at his word and lived appropriately now. So Jesus tells us to repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. And that, I think, is a very fair summary of the whole of the Sermon on the Mount. And so it's no wonder, is it, that he concludes the sermon with an appeal. It's decision time, we've got to choose. Uh, are we going to obey Jesus? Will we put his words into practice or not? And it's an urgent question, isn't it, because our eternal destiny depends on how we answer and not just with our lips, but with our lives as well. Are we going to go Jesus' way or not? Now perhaps at this point you're thinking, well hang on a moment. Doesn't the Bible teach that the way we get right with God is not on the basis of what we do, but on the basis of what Jesus did when he died on the cross? Doesn't our relationship with God depend on grace, on God's mercy, and not on our own performance? Isn't Jesus here contradicting the rest of the New Testament? And of course the answer is no, he isn't. Jesus is not saying that if we fail to obey every single detail of his teaching, that we have no chance whatsoever of entering God's kingdom. He is not saying that. But what he is demanding is our willingness to take him at his word. You see, if I believe that God's kingdom is coming as Jesus teaches, if I believe there's going to be a great division and that where we're going to spend eternity depends upon our response to Jesus Christ, well, that must make a difference in my life. I won't simply listen to the words of Jesus and do nothing about them. I won't simply call him Lord. No, if I'm wise, I'll change the direction of my life and seek to submit to him. You see, the Bible teaches, doesn't it, that by nature we all of us go our own way through life with a tiny little crown on our own heads. We live in our own kingdom and God has been, as it were, pushed out of it. But here comes Jesus, urging us to face reality. And so, much as we like to think that we're the king, in fact, we're not the king at all. There is only one king, his name is Jesus. And one day, his, king will be, his kingdom will be seen by everybody. 
and those who've not submitted to his kingdom rule will be pushed out and punished and you see as a Christian I am called to live in the light of these tremendous truths if I simply say yes Jesus I believe everything that you're saying I believe that you're the king I believe that you are going to come back and judge but do absolutely nothing about it and just carry on living with the crown on my head well then I'm the man who hears the words of Jesus but doesn't put them into practice and my house will come crashing down and that's why Jesus says at the end of the sermon repent turn round face reality take the crown off your own head and follow me so have you done that? have you repented? if you haven't it is high time you did but perhaps on the other hand you're thinking you know I've done that already I have turned and Jesus is my Lord well if that's you can I ask is there some evidence for that claim in your life because earlier on in the sermon Jesus says that unless our righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven but you see the Pharisees were content merely to observe the letter of the law and yet in this sermon Jesus urges us to go much much further seeking for instance not only to avoid murder but anger and not just adultery but lust do we do that? he goes on doesn't he to condemn religious hypocrites so are we more concerned about our relationship with God the Father than what other people think about us and Jesus goes on to say from there that we are to put the concerns of the kingdom before our concerns for food and drink and clothing can we say that we do that now you see if we can't say yes to any of those questions however feebly however tentatively well we should be worried because if Jesus really is Lord if he is our Lord there will be some evidence of that in our lives because one day we will be examined by our maker and what will he see? will he see fakes? or will he see the genuine article? so yes the teaching of Jesus forces us to ask ourselves some uncomfortable questions have I actually repented? have I truly begun to follow Christ? am I the real thing? you see if there's any doubt about that I need to make sure and that means taking Jesus seriously and, and showing that I take him seriously by obeying him because he's looking for obedience more than pious words and he's looking for obedience not just head knowledge now that is strong language and I wonder how it makes you feel there might be somebody listening to this or watching it and the truth is that quite frankly you're unmoved by what Jesus is saying uh, you're conscious that there are parts of your life where you're being disobedient but you've no real plan to do anything about it well be warned because one day you will stand before Jesus as your judge will he know you? But there may be others who's, who've been disturbed this morning and as the Holy Spirit highlights areas where you've been disobeying Christ you're feeling convicted uh, part of you is saying that you want to obey and you do want to put the kingdom first but another part of you is saying well quite honestly I haven't been living Jesus' way in every area and you're feeling bad about that and you do want to change well to you I say be encouraged because the Sermon on the Mount brings tremendous comfort to you no we don't have to be perfect to enter God's kingdom Jesus is not teaching salvation by works everything depends upon God's grace so remember how the Sermon on the Mount begins blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven and blessed are those who mourn 
for they will be comforted. You see, it's those people who recognise their helplessness and grieve because of their sin who receive the comfort of God's kingdom. Not those who point proudly at their own achievements. No, it's the meek. Not those who think they're good enough for God, but those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. I guess most of us this morning have been convicted by our disobedience because quite honestly there is something of the fraud and the fake in all of us. But the question is how are we going to respond to these penetrating powerful words of Jesus? Are we going to be hearers only or are we going to ask for God's help to put them into practice? Are we wise or foolish? Are we, are we real Christians or are we fakes? Amen.